Hello, and welcome back to another fabulous edition of the Celtics Lab podcast. Free agency has just kicked off. Players are flying around the league. It's almost impossible to keep track of who's going where. Kevin Durant could be traded as we're recording this podcast, and we are here to break down a pretty eventful start to free agency on the Celtics Lab podcast for our beloved Boston Celtics with special guest Corey Waldron, who is here to break down the Malcolm Brogdon um, trade. Corey is, of course, the host of Full Access Pacers, writer for Off the Glass, and a longtime friend of the pod and our go-to Pacers guy. Corey, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Uh, I'm actually doing even better now that Brogdon is traded, which uh, may seem odd for uh, some people looking at the trade details as they came out from Woj, because uh, it does seem a little bit lopsided, but I'm I'm happy. Uh, and obviously, I think since you guys are coming off an NBA Finals low, uh, this is pretty much picking you guys right back up on your feet. That would be pretty nice if it works out that way. Uh, I am, of course, Alex Goldberg. Cam is once again working on his jump shot, so he's not going to be here. Um, but I will be guest hosting today's episode. And as always, I am joined by Dr. Justin Quinn. JQ, how are you doing today? Well, I'm a little frazzled. Uh, I was in the middle of making a really complicated homemade ramen uh, complete with dried shiitake and all kinds of other yummy stuff. Uh, and then I had to that make it <laughs> for about an hour so that, was, that was fun all right well let's get right into it fellas um we're gonna start us off the celtics are making moves we're gonna start not with the malcolm brogdon trade which we'll get to in a little bit but first with the first move that the celtics made for today signing danilo gallinari to a one plus one deal with a player option in the second year for the taxpayer mid-level so that's going to come in at about six and a half million for each of those two years. I'm going to swing it to you first, Corey. What did you think when you saw Gallinari headed to the Celtics? Well, I mean, we we know the importance of wings, um, even though Gallo really can't play small forward anymore as he's gotten older, his uh, lateral quickness, which was never really there, has, has definitely gone uh, downwards. But I mean, this is still a guy who was putting up, I think, just under 12 points per game with Atlanta last year. She still shoots right around 40% from three. That added shooting, that added floor spacing, um, it just fits in, especially when, you know, Grant Williams, although was fantastic for you guys most of the playoffs, he was pretty much a no-show in that in that NBA Finals. Having a guy like Gallo might have been a nice option to turn to if you had someone you could just plug in who can maybe hit two or three corner threes. Um, but I definitely think it's, you know, a, you know, it's a solid move to start off free agency, especially with what, you know, what's to come. Justin, what do we think Gallo's role is going to look like here in Boston? How do you envision Ime Udoka and company using him? I think he's mostly going to be filling in for Horford, as we were kind of just alluding just now. I don't really think that he can defend. Um, he's played down to the two throughout his career. That's not happening in Boston. That Those days are gone. Um, I think he can, you know, if, if he's facing a slower three, he can, he can stay on the floor as, as a positional three. But, I mean, position doesn't really matter that much to the Celtics team anyway with how much they switch. So, really, most likely he's going to be playing the four where he can kind of hit Yeah, I tend to agree. I was watching a little bit of Gallo footage earlier today. His mobility is definitely not what it used to be. But, you know, again, in a limited role, his job is mostly to set up hit, hit threes. And he does have still a little bit of mid-post game. He's not a bad passer. He can still drive to the rim slowly, but he can get there and he's got size enough that he can force the issue. Obviously, it's going to have to be in a limited minutes capacity just because the Celtics rotation is pretty stuffed right now. But I expect that he'll definitely get some run. And it seems like he signed specifically with the goal of chasing a title in Boston. So I think any role where he gets to contribute, he, I'm hoping, will be relatively happy. Um, full taxpayer mid-level is maybe a little bit more than I think people were expecting for Gallinari heading into this. You know, he is 33. He's a little bit on the decline, even though his stats are not terrible for a role player. Um, Corey, I'm gonna think it, I'm gonna swing it to you first. Overpay for Danilo? It it might be a slight overpay, but again, like I, I kind of feel like I don't know if you guys have felt this way, but like kind of even just gauging the the overall free agency this year, it feels like certain guys I'm just way off on how much money they're getting. And then certain guys are coming in with money. I'm like, oh man, like I can't believe you didn't get more. 
Um, and same thing with trade packages. It, it's really hard to gauge the the value of certain players on the market. So I think it might be a slight overpay. But if you look at, like you guys already have mentioned, the switchability of this Boston Celtics team, obviously one of the best defensive teams um, we were we had in the league last year, especially post January. Um, I just think they they were looking for more of an offensive punch, so they weren't too focused on what they were losing on the back end, which is I'm guessing how they were able to rationalize it. JQ, what do you think? Was this too much? Do you want him? That's really what it comes down to because someone would have signed him for that much. And I think that for what he's going to be expected to do, it might be a little bit much, but in terms of paying, you know, you have to pay the premium for the availability. So I think that's what we have to pay. Yeah, I think that's right. And ultimately the second year player option is what people have a little bit of quibbles over. Gallo is going to be 34 heading into his age 35 season on that second year. You know, at the end of the day, the taxpayer mid-level is at the very worst, always going to be a tradable contract that you can aggregate in other deals. So if for whatever reason, Gallinari doesn't work out in Boston, it's not like he's going to be unmovable at that salary. So I think it's probably fine. It might be a slight overpay. But again, if you're trying to win the title, which based on these moves, the Celtics clearly are, um, I think that's totally fine. All right. So, Corey, the reason that we brought you on here is because you are the most knowledgeable person that we know about one Malcolm Brogdon, who the Celtics just traded for this afternoon. The deal is as follows. Aaron Neesmith, Daniel Tice, a 2023 first round pick, Nick Stauskas, bench mob hero Malik Fitz and Juwan Morgan are heading to Indiana for Malcolm Brogdon, who's heading back to Boston. I'm going to swing it to you first, Corey. What was your initial reaction when you saw the details of this trade? Well, my initial reaction was, yes, Brogdon's off my, my team. Um, we're, we're going through a, a transition period. It's all about Halliburton now. Um, but that, that was my initial reaction. Um, and then, of course, being... Uh, pretty much as a fan of the NBA and basketball, my second thought right off the bat was, man, the Celtics are really deep. I, they, they didn't take this loss in the NBA finals lightly. They took it as a challenge of how can we make sure we're back there again next year? And that's what this move screamed to me. Um, you know, and you look at the deal and now, yes, I, I know, again, I'm not disagreeing. The Celtics won this trade, especially in the short term, because you're trying to win a title and winning a title means you make these kind of moves for a player of Malcolm Brogdon's caliber. So again, you look at the original trade. I know Pacer fans, some of them who aren't really thinking clearly, like, wow, we just gave him away for a, a button and a piece of string. Like that's all we got for him. But you also added cap flexibility on the Pacer side. The Pacers are big game hunting DeAndre Ayton. We'll see how that, ha- how that, you know, transpires with the Kevin Durant news that dropped yesterday. Um, but the Pacers are looking for the future and the Celtics are looking in the now. And this is kind of how you have to look at the two moves because they're both looking at different timelines. And I think when you look at it in that perspective, this of course was a, I think a win for both teams, but it's a, a sure fire win for the Celtics who, again, not to kind of go too far ahead. I think you guys are all happy with how Marcus Smart played at the second half of the season, but I still think there are times, especially late in games, when you need more of a playmaking guard, which is more so Brogdon than it is Marcus Smart. So I think that's where the real benefit comes in. It's no shade at Marcus Smart, but this is a, a, a more capable ball handler late in games, especially in the half court set, which I think the Celtics offense, as we can all agree, uh, gets a little bit stagnant at times. So any, are there any players in that deal that are of interest to you as a Pacers fan, or is it just about the pick and clearing up salary flexibility? I mean, the Pacers definitely have a need at the wing, especially if they don't bring back TJ Warren. Um, so, so Naismith may be a guy who, who earns some minutes and earns a role in the rotation. Uh, I don't think Lance Stevenson's coming back. So there, there could be minutes at the, at the forward position. Um, it just kind of depends on what TJ Warren's future looks like. So I think he's probably the most, um, intriguing piece and the this now gives the Pacers three first round draft picks next year which is ideal when you're rebuilding definitely JQ what did you think when you saw this trade go down I was flabbergasted utterly did not expect like I said I was making ramen because I was convinced that whatever was going to happen with the Celtics would be tomorrow or the day after and that I was basically going to need to come up with some stuff to like fill my quota of articles for the day uh I think that this is actually really under like a sneaky good deal for the Pacers because 
if you listen to Celtics fans, they are not super crazy about the development of Neesmith, right? But if you look at what he did for the Celtics last season, even without his shooting, he's become a pretty competent defender, if still a little bit out of control. And at the end of last season, by the end of last season, he was shooting 37% from three, which is, you know, not the absolute sniper he was billed as coming into the league, but... He needs to play and he's going to be able to play a lot more with the Pacers than he's going to be with the Celtics. So for, for my mind, they did this guy a really big solid extracted some value out of, you know, whatever promise he might have before it's, you know, ultimately decided one way or the other. Um, I'm a believer as Alex knows all too well. Uh, And I think that Tice, even though he's a bit overpaid at $8 million a year, he's a very competent center. And I think he's going to do very well with you guys. Yeah, I largely agree. I think Neesmith kind of needed another team to spread his wings a little bit. He just wasn't going to crack the rotation with this squad. There were too many players ahead of him who just are clearly better and priority for a team that is, again, trying to win the title. And I think that's kind of been the theme of the Brad Stevens era. He has, for better or worse, and hopefully it appears for better, He's been all in on trying to win a title as soon as possible. All of these trades that he's made, Derek White, first round pick gone. Al Horford, first round pick gone. Now Malcolm Brogdon. Like Brad Stevens is not interested in developing young guys that can't help this team win right now. And Aaron Neesmith, while he might end up being a pretty good player, he's just a little bit too young to fit the team's identity for what they're trying to do. Um, On to more kind of details about the Malcolm Brogdon deal. Um, So first off, Jake Fisher of Bleacher Report says that the Indiana Pacers wanted Grant Williams in this deal, but Brad Stevens held pretty firm on that. I'm just curious, really quickly, Corey, one minute or less, would Grant Williams have helped this Pacers team for what they were going for? I I don't think the timelines really match up, um, but but I think Grant Williams would have been just a nice player player maybe even just the flip like he would have had a probably an expanded role in indiana maybe you can grow his value to then get something even better since he already is probably at the highest value he's ever had as a player coming off of the playoff run so i think you maybe could have used that to try and flip him down the road i think daniel tice is now the new guy who they're just going to flip eventually um but i think for williams they were just trying to get the most value uh and hoping the, the celtics would make a mistake and let him in the deal Yeah, I I read that and I kind of thought to myself, A, I'm glad Brad didn't do that. And B, it struck me as a little odd that Grant Williams would even be the guy who the Pacers would be asking about. It just seems like, as you said, the timeline is kind of not there. And while Grant is a good player, he is a utility guy. I don't think anybody particularly thinks that like Grant Williams is going to blossom into a star player. So I don't know. That one didn't make a ton of sense to me. I guess if you're just trying to get the most value back for another trade down the line. I could see it, but it was a little odd. Um, On to Malcolm Brogdon though. So he's making $22,600,000 this year, and he signed a contract extension with the Pacers already. So he's locked in for two more years after this one. Each year is at $22,500,000 apiece. Uh, So all in all, he's a three- year deal at roughly what 67 million dollar contract which puts the Celtics way over the luxury tax we could be as high as 35 million heading into our luxury tax bill next year it still depends on a couple of other moves Corey I'm going to swing it to you what can we as Celtics fans expect from Malcolm Brogdon leader um definitely a leader uh on and off the court I'm sure as, as we all know, um, Jalen Brown is uh, a very big activist for human rights. And Malcolm Brogdon and him, I, I believe, got close during 2020 during the George Floyd protests and everything else. So there's a connection there. Um, so I would imagine this also kind of makes Jalen Brown happier because I know they're friends. Um, in terms of the basketball fit, I mean, again, the biggest issue for Brogdon is he is hurt a lot. Uh, he hasn't played over 60 games in a single season yet with the Pacers. Um, I know for us Pacer fans, it felt like every other week there was a different injury, whether or not it was his heel, his hamstring, uh, shoulder. It feels like he was constantly getting banged up. But again, when healthy, you're looking at a guy who's a 50, 40, 90 guy. Um, he has been that good. He he showed that with the ball in his hands more with the Pacers, he can facilitate. He was very good with Samantha Sabonis. You can imagine him and Horford, him and Robert Williams having some combination in the pick and roll. Um 
again, and I think this is probably the most uh, sad from obviously playing with Giannis, who still wasn't fully developed yet. This is arguably the most talented team he's ever been a part of. Uh, I don't think that that's a long shot from a team that's in the finals, of course, but th- this is definitely a team that he's going to be able to not even have to put as much pressure on himself to score. He can just kind of facilitate and let guys give and go. So I think this might be the best version of Brogdon, given the fact that he doesn't need to to wear himself out. But he was also playing a ton of minutes with the Pacers as well. Uh, I think he was averaging almost 36 or 37 minutes per game at certain stretches of time so maybe that can help with the injuries if he's given a little bit of a smaller role but he's going to give you guys the full package from the point guard position for sure jq what do you think yeah i'm really excited about that aspect not the missing time aspect but if you had for example a malcolm brogdon who played 80 games a season if you had a marcus smart who played 80 games a season they'd probably be making somewhere close to 30 million dollars you put their salaries together, it's not that much more than that. And you have the insurance of having not just their availability, but their respective games working together in ways that can be brought to bear simultaneously when they are both healthy, but also kind of act as an insurance policy for when one of them inevitably is going to be missing time. Just to yeah. jump in real quick, I think another thing too is you know, before Brogdon got to the Pacers, he was a really good defender. Um, and I think because of how much on the off Defense he was asked to do for the Pacers. We saw that defense in Indiana take a step back. I could easily see him getting back to some of those all defense level type of production he was giving the Bucks, given the fact that he's not going to have to do as much on offense for the Celtics team. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I'm hoping that Brogdon in a six man role will reduce a lot of the wear and tear rather than having to play starter minutes every night. Um, Brogdon's shooting percentages have fluctuated a lot over his career. There are some seasons where Malcolm Brogdon has been like a 40%, 47% shooter from the corner, which is great. And there are some seasons where Malcolm Brogdon has not been that. So it's a little bit kind of, you, you don't quite know what you're getting. And I think the injury and the role consistency has a lot to do with that. But the ceiling of the Malcolm Brogdon acquisition is very high. And to your point about defense, Corey, I mean, imagine being an opposing guard and having to deal with Marcus Smart in the starters minutes. And then for your break, you get Derek White and Malcolm Brogdon. That just seems awful. That seems like the most miserable guard rotation to go against from a defensive perspective. I just, I can't imagine how unfun that would be as an opposing starting guard. And I'm really excited to see Ime Udoka, who I think is maybe one of the best defensive coaches in the league already, get to toy around with some of these lineups. Um, Plus, to your, just to your, your guys' points, too, I think your guys' switchability just got even better. I mean, again, Brogdon's another guy. He can guard one through three. I mean, he can guard some small forwards. He definitely has this, the strength and the body ability to do that. It's not ideal, but it's just another guy that Celtics can be like, okay, well, we're still switching everything. And I think that's the biggest thing the Celtics were looking for this offseason, where more guys that can just be like, well, we, we're not worried about the some of the defensive liabilities because we switch everything anyways. And Brogdon definitely fits that as well. So, JQ, the Celtics do now have a pretty stacked guard rotation. My question to you is, between Marcus Smart, Derek White, Peyton Pritchard, and now Malcolm Brogdon, are there too many cooks in this kitchen for the Celtics guard rotation? What do we think? It could end up playing out that way. Uh, They also have a bunch of smaller contracts now that they can combine should they feel the need to focus on something else. Uh, I'm not trying to push Al Horford out the door by any means, but at some point they are going to need to figure out what they're going to do with him. And if they don't think think they can get a good deal uh, for him, you know, like a team friendly, uh, you know, kind of trapes off into the sunset kind of a deal, then they're going to have to do something at power forward uh, for whatever you want to call it. And that would be a pretty good option. And, you know, there is this guy, you may have heard of him, Kevin Durant. He's reportedly on the market. And, you know, if they do want to make a consolidation, kind of a trade, throw a bunch of stuff at him. Um, I don't personally think that that's the route they're going to take. But if, you know, that's what the the Nets end up wanting, whatever the Celtics have, they are also in a good position to, if not have incredible depth afterwards, competent depth. More on that guy in a little bit, dear listener. We're going to wrap up our discussion of Malcolm Brogdon's trade here first. Um, So really quickly, Corey, I'm going to swing it to you. Is Malcolm Brogdon going to start or is he going to come off the bench for this Boston Celtics team? 
I honestly think he starts. Um, if, if I had to guess what your guy's starting five would be, I would guess it's Brogdon, Smart, Brown, Tatum, and Williams. I think this might be the year where Horford, again, was fantastic last year. Maybe having that season off between OKC and Boston gave him a little extra juice this past season. I would expect him getting older to be more of a six-man type of guy. But again, if you're trying to keep Brogdon as healthy as possible for the duration of the season, maybe him coming off the bench is the smarter move. I, I think that's really the question mark is, is who are you trying to save and who is more capable of playing long-term minutes, Horford or um, Brogdon? Of course, you guys know this. I mean, Horford and Robert Williams were one of the best defensive big combinations in the league this past season. So maybe you don't want to mess that up. JQ, what do you think? Starter or bench? Or Brogdon? Yeah. Uh, I think that Brogdon is going to be a super six man uh, and may even eclipse uh, Smart because Smart will almost inevitably miss time. Brogdon will probably also miss time. And whatever the matchup is, whether they feel that they need to have more passing, more more play creation, whether they feel they need to have more defense, I think that, that is going to dictate who ends up starting the game. I feel like you can't take Marcus Smart out of the starting lineup after he's coming fresh off of a defensive player of the year award. And there is a logical guy that would sit in Al who is now 36 and is definitely getting up there. But I am of the opinion that Malcolm Brogdon is going to start the season at the very least coming off of the bench and we'll see what happens there. Uh, so just kind of wrapping this up really quickly, the Celtics now have a lot of open roster slots, five of them to be specific, although it's probably going to be four of them once Sam Hauser is re-signed to his deal. Um, and it's been reported by Mark Murphy and others that the Celtics are going to be looking at getting a backup big spot to fill uh, the departed Daniel Tice's role. Uh, Thomas Bryant, former Washington Wizards center, has been linked to the Celtics, although he's also been linked to the Lakers, and it's unclear exactly where he's going to end up. We think that that's a realistic prospect for Celtics backup backup center spot. Corey, what do you think? Um, again, I'm not positive on who's exactly left on the backup center market, because um, again, like JaVale McGee, he kind of got paid a lot yesterday to be yep. the now starting center for the Mavericks, I guess, from what his ex expectations are. Um, you know, I think I think Thomas Bryant, because again, he had the ACL surgery, what, two years ago now, I think? Yeah. Um, 21, so January 21, I think he's a, yeah. Okay, yeah. So I, again, I, I think he's a solid option as a backup big. I don't know what Mike Muscala's market is, or if that's a guy maybe the Celtics the get on the cheap. I, I think he yeah. re-signed with OKC for the minimum, actually. Gotcha. Okay. But we gotcha. do have okay. trade exceptions, so that isn't necessarily off the table of that route. Mm. True. Okay. Yeah, um, I could definitely see Thomas Bryant, though, being an option. I, I'm not positive on, on any other big that really moved the needle. I feel like, Brian, if you're trying to still keep a big body in case Robert Williams has any more health issues then brian at least is the same type of big body who can move guys down low especially when you're looking at like a kevon looney type of matchup again yeah i think that would make a lot of sense we'll see there's definitely going to be dudes shaking loose in the coming days um jq it seems that uh jason tatum has some thoughts as to who the celtics might sign for their backup big spot uh he's tweeting about his good buddy harry giles who's been waived and said somebody should sign him we think that's a good idea for backup five. Uh, fourth backup five, like just an upside play that makes your star player happy. I don't see any bad reason to do that. I mean, they it seems that they there are a number of prospects who are going to be coming to summer league who would like to maybe make the team. Johan Beggerin is in the front of my mind, but to me. Um, there wasn't anyone on that roster who isn't already signed by the Celtics who I feel is necessarily going to be any better of an option as an upside play. And certainly none of them are going to make Jason Tatum happy. So why not? There are definitely still some plays that Brad Stevens can make, though. And one of them is that he's still sitting on a $17 million Evan Fournier traded player exception. However, with the exodus of these first round picks, it's probably going to be a bit trickier to actually get someone to fill that exception. And it's been reported that it's currently not in the Celtics plans to actually use it. They have a month or so to do it before it expires. What do we think, fellas? Is there a chance that the Celtics get somebody with this TPE for $17 million? Corey, you first. 
I mean, it's possible. Again, there, there's a, there's two players in Brooklyn with pretty big contracts that are going to be on their way out. So there's, I think there is some sort of avenue even for the Celtics to hop in and try to acquire somebody that they need to move cap space around. I think that's the luxury of having the TP is, is if one of these teams start getting hungry and trying to make a sweep, the Celtics are like, hey, you know, we have, we can absorb one of these contracts if this guy's going to help us win. Um, so I definitely think there's an avenue. It's just kind of waiting to see which domino is going to fall and, and what team is a part of that domino falling. JQ, any targets still available that you would like the Celtics to go after? Well, there's uh, Jay Crowder and Cam Johnson out in Phoenix who are a preferred destination for Kevin Durant. Uh, I could definitely see either one of those coming across. I think you could probably get Crowder for free. I think you have to attach at least a first round pick. Uh, for Johnson, I think either would be a useful addition. Both are expiring. I don't think we're going to see anyone add any years to this because that luxury tax bill will be absurd if they go past this year with that much salary on the books. Yeah, that would make sense. We'll see. Obviously, more to come there. So let's go through just some recent events. Obviously, we got a lot to recap as far as general free agency madness goes. And I have my Twitter open as we are doing this. So in case we get any breaking news, I will be the first to report it here. Um, so we got to start with the aforementioned two guys in Brooklyn. Um, and, you know, friends, Nick Fay and Jack Manuel, if you want to maybe turn this one off and go somewhere else at this time you're more than welcome to do that but Kevin Durant has formally requested a trade from the Brooklyn Nets in an earth-shattering move Kyrie Irving also appears to be headed out the door JQ I'll swing it to you first what do we make of this nonsense well uh let Corey answer that question I just want to point out that uh we do have some breaking news uh oh, <laughs> oh dear yeah and what's that it's not that, that Big, but it's important enough that we should mention it. It seems that uh, Brian Robb is reporting that the 2023 first round pick that the Celtics are trading to India, and I'm so sorry, uh, it's top 12 protected. If it doesn't convey this year, uh, the, the Pacers get a second round pick. It's going to convey this year. Yeah, yeah that's going to be like the 28th pick. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a fine protection. I, it makes sense. That's uh, Celtics just want to make sure there's a doomsday like uh, scenario that happens there. They're covered, which is fine. I, I didn't expect this to be anything higher than 25, to be honest. Yeah. So, Corey, what do we think about the chaos in Brooklyn? Um, I mean, again, I, I think this has been said, but has there ever been a team that went from title contenders to I don't know, rebuilding as fast as this has all come and gone, especially when you throw in the fact that KD signed an extension. Um, this is one of the most bizarre things I've seen across any sport. Um, of course, the NBA lives for the chaos, so it only think right that this is an NBA-like story. Um, but, I mean, it's it's also an unprecedented type of thing. I mean, Kevin Durant has four years or three years left on his deal. Um, we don't normally see star players, especially Hall of Famers, arguably top 10 all time, um, getting traded and demanding a trade in the prime of their career, even though he's obviously on the back end of his prime. Um, it, it's ridiculous. And I think, you know, not to step on anything else, but like Rudy Gobert getting four first round picks today. I mean, the bar has been set now. There's no way Durant goes for anything less, right? You just, you can't accept something like that without taking a massive L, um, it, it's, it's been a very bizarre day. I feel for Nick and Jack, our, our net, our net friends. Um, because I don't know, I don't even know how you can bring any star players back from free agency for the next five, 10 years, because they've completely botched this set of, um, this set of players, uh, potential and championship window. Where do we think he's going? Who I mean, we'll start with Kevin Durant. Phoenix, I think for Kevin. I think that's the most obvious one. I, I would not be surprised if a dark horse candidate like New Orleans found a way to get itself in the conversation. There's been some pushback that uh, he might not like it there, but uh, buddy, you got four years on your deal and you're 34 years old. Uh, I don't know if you can deal with holding out for a year and then expect to be able to necessarily compete for a title in the same sort of way you can now, if you even can now. So uh, I think I'm a little more skeptical that he will be so aggressive and say holding out for some destinations like a, a team like new orleans would be able to put together a pretty good team with whatever they would have left over after that Corey, what do you think where's kevin durant going to be playing next year 
I think Phoenix makes the most sense. Um, when I was, I was chatting, uh, off air, um, with Nick actually about this. And I think when it, when we see whatever happens with Deandre Ayton, if that's with the Pacers, I think that is the most likely three team trade scenario. Ayton goes to the Pacers, Pacers sends something to the nets and obviously Phoenix sends bridges and probably miles Turner, uh, maybe to the nets. I think there's some sort of combination there that works uh, at least money wise and then draft fast said maybe not um but i think phoenix makes the most sense given the fact that they have eight and bridges which are two young very intriguing players miami doesn't really have the money unless they're trading jimmy butler i don't think they're going to trade jimmy butler um so I, I think that's the most likely scenario but of course i feel like every time we do something like this there is still like like justin mentioned a dark horse that comes in of nowhere maybe it's the pelicans they obviously they have ingram they have some draft picks there's always that one team that you don't really expect that kind of throws their their hat in the ring um it, it's just it's it's very hard to fathom what the package looks like for durant given the fact he has years left on his contract and the fact that he's demanding out i wouldn't be shocked although just to throw this out there that if nothing happens and we see the Nets start the season with Durant and Irving. Um, but I think that's also not ideal for the Nets. Reportedly, about 20 teams have called the Brooklyn Nets about Kevin Durant, which I guess is to be expected since he's likely the best players available for a trade since Shaq, maybe something like that. Um, and is it based on some other moves, it sounds like going to probably command the biggest trade package return in NBA history. There's another guy in Brooklyn that we should probably talk about. His name is Kyrie Irving. What do we think is going to happen there? He has been linked to the Los Angeles Lakers in particular, which seems like it would be a pretty difficult trade to pull out, especially if the Brooklyn Nets don't want to take Russell Westbrook back. So, Corey, you first. Where is Kyrie Irving starting off the year next year? He's going to end up in Utah. No, I... <laughs> Uh, I mean, I want to say, though, obviously, it's a lot harder because of that rookie rule. So unless um, Ben Simmons is traded, you couldn't trade Donovan Mitchell to Brooklyn. I did have a moment of thought where when Rudy Gobert was traded, I was like, is Utah going to then trade Mitchell and try to get Kyrie and Durant to come to Utah because they want to play together? Because, again, if they do want to play together, there's only a couple teams that could do it. Utah definitely just freed up some cap space to do that. Obviously, I don't think it's going to happen. Um, but I don't know. Cause again, Irving has, you guys know, you guys are Celtics fans. You had him for a year and a half or whatever it was. He's extremely difficult to be around. I'm not saying he's a bad guy. I know he does great things in the community, but in terms of like a, a star player on a day-to-day basis, it, it is like Dr. Hyde and Mr. Jekyll or whatever that I'm sorry. I know I bought butchered that, but there is a very hard um, line that Kyrie kind of draws in the sand between his fan, his fans and his not fans. And it's hard to root for him. Um, but I, I think, I think whatever package comes to light, it's not, not going to be anything in terms of actual value for Kyrie Irving, the basketball player. It, it's going to be simply to get him off the roster. Justin, I would love to swing to you next, but before we do that, I have some breaking news that I need to drop on the podcast. It concerns the Boston Celtics. Are you ready, folks? Luke Cornett has agreed to a two-year deal to return to the Boston (laughs) Celtics per Chris Haynes. Celtics have solved their backup big problem. It's big Cornett. He's back at it again. No, just kidding. I'm sure they will get somebody else. But anyway, um, Luke Cornett is back, which I like. Sure. Why not? Um, Justin, where's Kyrie Irving going to play next year? There's only one team that really, really has any interest, as far as we know, in trading for him. And the question is, will they give up two first-round picks? They should. The Lakers. Clearly, I'm talking about the Lakers. They have two first-round picks they can give now. They should do it. And if it doesn't work out, then just let everybody leave when their contracts are up and start over and use your Laker mystique or whatever it is they do over there. So, yeah. All right. So Kyrie Irving, maybe a Laker, maybe on the Utah Jazz, maybe evaporating into the ether with Kyrie Irving, who even knows. I just want to say there would be some sort of like, like – comedy part of all of this if somehow the nets end up with just russell westbrook and they lose durant and 
Kyrie and Westbrook is still following in like Durant's shoes in a weird way. I feel like that would be hilarious as like an understory. Um, but yeah, no, that's all I got. That's entirely, you know, with Kyrie Irving being involved, I truly wouldn't put anything past anybody at this point. Um, so speaking of the Indiana Pacers, um, we mentioned briefly that they might have been linked to DeAndre Ayton as well as the aforementioned Russell Westbrook. I have seen some murmurs to that effect. Uh, Miles Turner is also once again in trade rumors, which is, seems like it's got to be the 19th time in the past two years. Um, Corey, we're going to swing it to you. What's going on with Indy post Malcolm Brogdon trade? What is real? What is not real? What should we be preparing for? I mean, honestly, it's it's as simple as if they can sign DeAndre Ayton, they like the timelines. Um, obviously, Tyrese Halliburton has shown that he is a, a ridiculous high IQ passer. Um, you add in a real lob threat rim runner in DeAndre Ayton, the best rebounder the Pacers have arguably had, at least with size. Sabotis was very good at rebounding, but he's also undersized. So at least they get a true center. Um, obviously the miles Turner stuff. I love miles Turner. He's my guy. I think everyone knows that. Um, but there are issues in terms of his health. He has not been very durable over the last few seasons, his three point shooting, although it is, it is very hot and cold. It's a benefit, but if you're not on the floor and you're not rebounding well, and then your three point percentage is under 34%, doesn't make you as, as valuable as it probably should. Um, and given the fact he's also an expiring contract, he's going to get what next year? 25 million, 30 million, arguably it'll be 26. It might just make sense to throw the bag at DeAndre Ayton. I would prefer Miles Turner because I'm, I'm stubborn in my ways and prefer a guy who's been there his entire career so far. Um, but I think the pace are looking for the fact that Ayton is 23. Halliburton is 21, 22. You just got bad Ben Matherin, who is also 19, going to be 20. So you have a timeline that makes more sense. Hopefully when these guys are all in their prime, the Celtics, the Warriors, uh, the, the the Mavs aren't too good by then. Hopefully like the, the teams ahead of them are, are no longer the powerhouses as I'm guessing their thought. JQ, what do you think is going on with the Indiana Pacers heading into this off season? Should we believe the miles Turner trade rumors? Is this actually happening finally, or is it just more smoke? I will believe miles Turner trade rumors when they're no longer trade rumors. Uh, I'm not real clear on whether this is a full teardown or kind of more of a retool, they've always been pretty adamant that they are not going to do a full teardown, but this looks dangerously close to one. So I'm going to be really curious to see how it plays out. Just to, to be, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure there was comments made by the assistant GM after the draft that, that pretty much signal this is a rebuild. Um, and it pretty much was like, we're going to move Brockton for sure. The Turner thing, they're not too, they're not too quick to pull the trigger because he is only 25 to 26. So he's still, he still technically could fit the timeline if they get good in the next four years. Um, but, but they are definitely looking at the rebuild. They're not focused at all on the, uh, on the present day. And, you know, I had, I think that just, it just makes sense, right? Like you swung a big home run trade for Tyrese Halliburton, a trade that I think, both myself and many others thought was a pretty impressive coup for the Pacers front office heading into the end of last year. Um, you've got Mathurin obviously coming in. Um, you've got a lot of young players, Chris Duarte, for example, who have some pretty significant upside. It would make a whole lot of sense if the Pacers, particularly with some very tall, looming draft prospects coming up, might take this year and spend a little bit more time losing than winning. Um, are, are you are you excited about Victor, Corey? Possibility of Victor? I mean, we're not going to get him. I, I, I'm I'm a Pacers <laughs> fan. We don't we don't get those top three picks. No one wants them to go to Indiana. Uh, um, no. That's my draft my draft conspiracy. But I mean, that kid looks crazy. I was watching highlights. Uh, before the last draft, just because I was curious on all the hype. I mean, he's, he's a ridiculous freak. Um, do I think he falls to the Pacers? No, I feel like he ends up in San Antonio somehow. Um, mm. But no, he, he's definitely an intriguing prospect. Next year's draft class also, from what I've been told and from the brief things I've read and seen, is it's going to be better than this year, which I also thought was a pretty good draft class. Oh, yeah. I mean, even if you don't end up with Victor, Scoot Henderson is going to be really, really good. Yeah. Um, I think this is a perfectly fine year to you know, take a year off. 
so to speak. A um, couple other big moves, and then we'll get you out of here, Corey. So Rudy Gobert is heading to Minnesota for four first-round picks. Danny Ainge is at it again, creating a war chest of picks to do God knows what with. Um, a bunch of other guys are headed over to uh, the Utah Jazz as well, most notably Patrick Beverly is headed to the Utah Jazz, along with, I believe, Malik Beasley. Is that right, Justin? Yep. I could be wrong about That's that. That's right. Uh, yeah. And then uh, I think Jared Vanderbilt. I don't, this trade was crazy to follow. What do we think about the now twin towers of Minneapolis, Rudy Gobert and Carl Anthony Towns together? I mean, I got to be honest. I said, like, it was yesterday, the day before, I was like, I don't think you can win um, when your best player as a center makes over $30 million a year, unless he's Embiid or Jokic. The only two other centers that make over $30 million a year are Towns and Gobert, and now they're on the same team. Um, mm-hmm. it, it's, very, it's very interesting to see how those two guys are going to coexist. Obviously, Towns stretches the floor more, um, but this is Minnesota going all in. I kind of feel for Pat Beverly because he was on Twitter last night, like throwing heart emojis about Towns getting his extension. Um, again, when you're that kind of mediocre like player, you get dealt in a, a majority of these deals. Um, I, I would say I, I think Utah has put themselves in a really good position to add whatever talent they want alongside of Donovan Mitchell. You can even attach one of these first round picks to get rid of Mike Connolly if you're looking to do so as well. So they've definitely given themselves some flexibility. Of course, Danny Ainge and Brad Stevens have pretty much been winning the day. Uh, go figure. Uh, Celtic tie is going strong. Um, I, I would be a little concerned, though, if I'm Minnesota on on the basket I just put all my eggs into because I, I wasn't thrilled with how Towns played in the playoffs last year. He had some no-show moments. And Gobert, although he's a great regular season center, we have seen those playoff uh, deficiencies on full display numerous times. So there, there's a lot to be concerned about, I think, if you're Minnesota, especially when, like you just mentioned, there was four first-round picks thrown in this deal. JQ, what's going on in Utah? What's going on in Minnesota? What are we supposed to make of all of this? Well, with Minnesota, I'm going to push back a little bit just because, yeah, right now I agree with you. There's too much talent in the front court for today's NBA, but I don't think this is going to be the best player on the team is a big man in this team. Maybe by the end of this season, probably the season after, I think it's going to be Anthony Edwards' team at that point. Mm. And if that ends up playing out as I think they, that's their plan, then it's going to be interesting because we haven't really seen this kind of talent invested in a front court with a player like that. So I think it could work, but it really depends on what they do around the margins. And then with Danny Ainge, really the only thing that I have to say with everything being so nebulous at this point uh, is I'm really looking forward to all the players who almost end up in Utah. Man, this is Danny really is playing to type here. He is the exact same guy that he was in Boston, which is, to be clear, a very good GM, but also a dude that is going to frustrate the league and potentially his own fans to no end. Um, other stuff, let's see, big names for the most part staying put. Zach Levine is going to stay in Chicago on a max contract. Bradley Beal is going to stay in Chicago on a max contract. Devin Booker is staying. John Morant is staying. Nikola Jokic, the league's back-to-back MVP, oh, he's staying. staying for a whole lot of money, the most in NBA history. Congratulations to you, Nikola. Um, any interesting things that we need to talk about? Any moves that jumped out, surprised us? Anything like that here, Corey or JQ, either one? I, I don't think there was any moves that really blew me away. Um, I was not surprised, but go figure that everyone the Lakers signed seemed to be a clutch um, player. Um, they're just keeping all those clutch players right close to LeBron in L.A., um, I don't think there was anything though that, that really blew, blew me off the table. I I'm still concerned if you're a wizards fan for how much money you're putting into Bradley Beal at age 30, the moves for Monte Morris and Will Barton, I actually don't hate. I just don't know how the rest of that roster comes together and makes any, any real sense, um, for them moving forward. JQ, any other big free agency takeaways? 
Uh, I, I am also fascinated by what's going on in Washington. I'm, I'm confused as to whether they're just kind of like happy in a treadmill of mediocrity so long as they get to have their guy there that everyone wants to be there. And if that's what they want, that's totally fine. It's a very valid thing to do if you're not a major market team, but they're kind of a major market team, right? So what are they doing with that? Uh, I've seen some speculation that Beal will ask out at some point before the end of his deal, maybe even fairly soon. I have no idea, but with the amount of money he's being paid, there's a very limited range of places he could end up in the first place. So really, really confusing. Man, free agency does not stop ever. So um, folks, we are gonna get you out of here on this, but really quickly, Corey, where can we find your work? Yeah, um, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram at KWAL Hoops, that's K-W-A-L Hoops. Uh, podcast would be full access Pacers. Um, and we might be starting the outlet soon, but that will be coming soon. Perhaps more news on that. Excellent. All right. So uh, let's get out of here on this note. Corey, now one and a half ish days into free agency. What is the next big shoe to drop? What do you think is happening? Oh, it, it's it's for sure. Kevin Durant. Kevin, because I think teams now are waiting to see where Durant goes before they use up the rest of their cap space or move around any of their assets. So it's Kevin Durant. And if I had to guess, because July 4th seems to be one of these days in general where a lot of weird stuff happens, I would guess by July 5th, we know exactly what's happening with the Brooklyn Nets and those two stars. All right. JQ, what about you? What's the next big shoe to drop? Who boy. Well, maybe... Uh... This guy, Sam Hauser, I hear he's up for a deal. That's probably like the next big shoot to drop. Yeah, that sounds right. I think that's a very good point. Obviously, Luke Cornette, explosive news broken earlier today in the pod. I think one guy that we might want to keep an eye on heading into these next couple of days, another player for the Utah Jazz, Donovan Mitchell. So uh, the Jazz said that their plan is to rebuild with this now Worcester picks around Donovan Mitchell. I'm not sure that I buy it, having spent some time with Danny Ainge as my GM. We'll see. Lots more to come on many different stories going together in the NBA, and you'll hear about it as well as any other relevant Celtics news here on the Celtics Lab podcast. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.